Different world, isn't it? It is. It's a different world. And I'm, I'm at peace with the fact that I don't understand anything that goes on. We got all these wimpy kids now. They don't have a backbone like my generation did. No, they're wimpy. I, you can see, okay, here's the deal. I took my grandson to T-ball one year, and I'm standing behind the coach. And I'm, I'm looking, and I don't see a scoreboard. So I finally I tapped the coach. I said, hey, coach, come here. I don't see a scoreboard anywhere around here. He goes, oh, Mr. Poole, we don't have a scoreboard in T-ball. Why not? It's a baseball game. Well, we don't want the kids to know they're losing because they'll feel bad about themselves. I said, Coach, my grandson can count. He's been in center field for an hour watching all these other kids run around the bases. I think he knows he's getting his butt kicked. <laughs> you know when we started raising wimpy kids? I'll tell you exactly when we started raising wimpy kids, when we started putting warning labels on toys. I did not have warning labels on my toys because my parents knew if they did not kill me, they would make me stronger. <laughs> and I can prove it because when I was seven years old, my parents gave me a wood-burning set. <laughs> yeah, well, allow me to explain over here, young lady. A wood-burning set, for those of you who had one, remember, they came with these blocks of wood, had a little picture on it, and an electric pencil that heated to 15 hundred degrees. <laughs> yeah, what could go wrong there? You'd plug it in, heat it to 1500 degrees, you would burn that little picture into the wood, you would color it in, put some varnish on it, take it over to your grandmother's house, she would tell you how nice it was, you would leave and she would throw that crap away. <laughs> I got mine, I go to my room, I am back five minutes later. I have third degree burns on both hands <laughs> and my initials are burned in my cat's butt. <laughs> so I'm standing in front of my father who is six foot five. I have tears rolling down my face. He bends over, he looks at me, and he says, and I quote, well, guess we won't do that again, will we? <laughs> That's how we learned. We had a, we, look, here's the deal, okay? We survived a little thing called the slip and slide. Now, that was the original slip and slide that was held down by metal spikes. <laughs> Slide over one of those, you young guys, you will not need a vasectomy. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> we had a small hill out behind my house. Wasn't very big. I got one, I was like eight, eight and a half, nine years old, and I took it out of the box. I rolled it down the hill. I drove those six metal spikes into the ground. I attached the hose, went over to the house to the outlet, and I turned the water on. So now that my slip and slide was really slippy and slidey, I get back about 20, 25 feet. And just as I start my run toward that slip and slide, it dawned on me at the bottom of the hill was a chain link fence. <laughs> and I heard my mother say to my dad, aren't you gonna tell him? <laughs> and dad looks at her and goes, nope, he'll learn. <laughs> so I hit that slip and slide like 90 miles an hour. And for the next 15 minutes, they dug me out from under that chain link fence. <laughs> and I'm back at the top of the hill. I have tears rolling down my face. My father stands in front of me, bends over, says, and I quote, well, guess we won't do that again, will we? <laughs> That's how we learned. We survived a little thing called an M80 cherry bomb. <laughs> Let me help you young people out. It was about that big around, had a short green fuse. Third world countries use those in their wars today. <laughs> And you would take it outside, put it under an empty can of Del Monte number no. eight French cut green beans, <laughs> light the fuse, and run for your life. <laughs> because when that thing went off, the can went 112 feet in the air, and there was an eight inch hole in the ground. <laughs> My mother gave me those by the bag full. <laughs> And her only instructions when I went outside, don't forget your matches. That's it. 
Don't forget your matches. We survived the playground. Now that needs a little explanation. Have you looked at a playground lately? All right, they whipped out the playground. You go to a playground, what do you see? Well, the monkey bars are sitting on this rubber padding. Because if the kid falls off, we don't want him to scratch his knee. And you go over to the swing set, and it's sitting on rubber padding. In case the kid falls off, he won't scratch his knee. And the corner of everything on that playground is covered in rubber padding in case the stupid kid runs into it. <laughs> We didn't have that growing up. I grew up in Kentucky, middle of summer, 930,000 degrees, <laughs> middle of July. My mother was tired of having me around the house already. I got this, go to the playground, don't come home till dark. That was good parenting back then. So I'd go down there and I'd climb up on the monkey bars in the middle of July and they were hot because they'd been in that July sun all day long, but I didn't dare fall off because for my protection, they were sitting on a pad of asphalt. <laughs> which is the same stuff that road out there is made out of. And then you'd go into the middle of the playground, and this is where you got religion as a kid. You go to the middle of the playground to that big aluminum slide, remember that? <laughs> and in the middle where it did that little bump, you'd get stuck every time. And you're sitting there, and you're doing this scoochy thing, <laughs> but you're not going anywhere, and that is when you found God. That is when you began to pray for a fat kid to come along and <laughs> knock you loose. <laughs> and you learn things on a playground. You know the first thing I learned? Don't get on a teeter-totter with a fat kid. <laughs> he will launch you over the fence. 